Hello to all and welcome to the webinar, Planning a Plan B School District Election, intended to give information to district clerks who will be running the first ever absentee ballot only school election on June 9th, 2020. Many thanks to Bon, Shonick and King and the three school board associations who are co-sponsoring this webinar, the Dutchess County SBA, the Rockland County SBA and the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association. Special thank you to Stacey Agona, the West Putt Program Coordinator, who's a constant point of contact for district clerks and coordinates all of our district clerk events. I'm Karen Belanger, the Executive Director of the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association. Our three regional school boards associations are all available to help district clerks in any way we can. Obviously, your school district attorneys are far more knowledgeable than I regarding the legal aspects of running any school election and their guidance is critically important as we try and interpret what adjustments to the normal election process are permitted or required by the governor's executive order. We're hopeful that today's webinar will give you a general understanding of how to plan this year's school district election, although we know all of you will continue to discuss specific issues with your district's attorneys. Many thanks to our two presenters today, Candace Gomez and Kate Reed of Bon Shonek and King. In between answering the many questions that the districts they represent have undoubtedly been throwing at them over the past few days, Candace and Kate volunteered to put together a presentation and answer the questions of district clerks in the Lower Hudson region regarding planning a Plan B school district election. Thank you to all the clerks who sent us questions. Your questions have been incorporated into the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to attorneys Candace Gomez and Kate Reed to provide guidance on how to plan the June 9th school election. Candace and Kate? Great. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Thank we you appreciate Karen. that we great appreciate introduction. That great introduction. We're so happy to We're have so the opportunity to partner to with the Westchester West Putnam West School Boards Association, Board Association, the Dutchess the County School Boards Association. Board Association and also the Rockland County School Boards Association. Uh, we also want to uh, thank our many bond clients for participating in this webinar. Uh, we do appreciate the time that you're taking to be part of this and we hope that it is helpful to you. Uh, just kind of a quick overview of the presentation. This is not what we would consider a beginner course in school elections. We understand that many of you have been running school elections for quite a while. Uh, you are seasoned professionals and quite sophisticated in your understanding of elections. Uh, and this webinar is more focused on the specific issues uh, that you may encounter regarding the 2020 election, which is very different from any election that any of us have ever been involved with in the past. Uh, we have incorporated many questions into this webinar uh, that Karen received from the various uh, school board associations and district clerks, and the majority of this webinar will be focused on answering those questions. We want to start by remembering a few facts. Even though this is an election unlike any other time that we've experienced, there are a few um, kind of guiding principles that we should keep in mind. Number one, the role that you play in school district elections is critically important. You are helping voters to participate in the democratic process while you're simultaneously helping to prevent the spread of COVID-19 through the remote voting procedures that you implement. And I don't think that we can uh, underestimate or um, kind of minimize the importance um, of that role because although our country and the world is going through a very unprecedented time, you are helping to maintain some sense of normalcy and making sure that people still have that fundamental right to vote. So we appreciate the role that you're playing in keeping that going during this time. We also want to remember that New York State education law supersedes New York State election law. Uh, during every uh, school election time, we inevitably hear someone say, well, the county is doing it this way, or we heard that during the general election, they did it that way. And that's good for us to know, but ultimately it will be the New York State education law, not the election law that governs uh, when and how we do certain things during our school district elections. And the education law and election law are different in many respects in terms of how elections are run. 
We also want to remember that during this election, not only are we applying the New York State education law, but we're also, of course, applying Executive Order 202.26, which uh, Governor Cuomo issued this past Friday late in the evening. And it seems that none of our lives have been the same since as we're trying to analyze and uh, put that into play at this time. And of course, we also want to remember that the Commissioner of Education has exclusive and final authority over election disputes. So since the Commissioner is going to be the final authority, we want to remember what does the Commissioner keep in mind when determining whether or not an election should be overturned or how mistakes should be handled. And we know that the Commissioner has consistently ruled that an election will not be overturned for technical irregularities unless there is a very strong showing that the outcome would have been different, but for the irregularity. So there may be certain mistakes that are made uh, during this election. I know that everyone is doing their absolute best under difficult circumstances to implement the law to the best of their ability. If there is a mistake that is considered minor and a mere technical irregularity that would not have had a uh, detrimental significant effect on the overall election, it is something that likely the commissioner would say does not warrant overturning the results of the election or uh, nullifying uh, the work that you have done. So we just want to keep in mind that we never want mistakes, but every mistake does not mean that the election is automatically void. We want to keep that in mind. And of course, Executive Order 202.26 was issued by the governor on June 9th, uh, 2020. And it stated that elections would occur and voting would occur only by absentee ballot. The executive order is very unclear. There are still many, many questions that remain. And we do want to point out that there are conflicting reasonable legal interpretations that can be reached. Uh, in the event that we say something that maybe your school attorney has disagreed with, we would strongly encourage you to have a discussion with your school attorney and ultimately be guided by the direction and by the advice of your particular school attorney. We have great respect for our colleagues in the school law bar. Uh, they are very bright individuals. We've been conferring with them in, pre in preparation for this presentation. And it doesn't mean that one person is wrong and the other person is right. We have to remember that this executive law was crafted um, in a very short space of time. We are now running an election based on a couple of paragraphs uh, that were independently uh, written without much uh, review by anyone. It didn't go through a complete legislative process where there was a review period and public comments and revisions and the whole typical gamut of um, stages that usually go through legislation. So we have to expect that it's not going to be as complete as the normal uh, legislative process. And because of that, there are many gaps and plenty of room for interpretation and misinterpretation. So we want you to follow the advice of your school attorney, although we hope that what we say during this presentation uh, will be helpful to you as you go along through the process. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Reed. Like my partner, Candace, I'm a school attorney at Bond. Thank you also to Karen for, for giving me an opportunity to speak and reach folks today as well. Um, so Candace has given you the overview of how we got to today and having to plan a plan B election. Um, I'm going to go through some of the specifics that many of you, this may seem like old news to many of you by now because um, so much has transpired, as Candace said, since Friday. But we want to make sure the basics are covered as well in terms of what this executive order means for the days leading up to your annual meeting. Um, so per the executive order, the requirement of signatures on nominating petitions has been waived. Um, and this is just what it seems like. Uh, no signatures need to be gathered anymore. Um, we are recommending that nominating petitions still be submitted, although not with, not with signatures on them, because there's still a date specified for receipt in the law, which is May 11th, 2020 at 5 p.m. We've received a lot of questions around whether that's postmarked five, uh, by 5 p.m. May 11th, but the answer is, is no. It actually needs to be received by the district clerk's office no later than 5 p.m. on May 11th in order for a candidate to be placed on the ballot. Next slide, Candace. 
Thanks. Um, there's provisions in the new executive order that pertain to budget hearings. And something that I think Candace already touched on that I just want to repeat is that as we're interpreting the executive order, um, this is why we have such uh, wonderful and interesting jobs as attorneys. We're not just reading the executive order, but we're reading the executive order to see which provisions of the education law have been supplanted, replaced, modified, or which ones remain the same. There are um, literally hundreds of provisions regarding school elections in the education law. The executive order changed some, but not all of them. So as we go through here, we're going to try to explain to you which ones were changed by the executive order versus which ones remain the same just by virtue of the, those provisions not having been changed by the education by, by the executive order. So we have always had a requirement for a budget hearing, which is a requirement um, under the education law. It must be held seven to 14 days prior to the vote. Um, that requirement was not changed by the executive order. However, there's some things to keep in mind, um, just best practices and pointers with respect to that budget hearing. So as I said, timing is pretty clear, seven to 14 days prior to your vote on June 9th. Um, however, the means by which that budget hearing will be conducted is not necessarily clear. Um, so per 202.15, an earlier executive order, the governor was pretty clear that any public hearing that was mandated to be held during the months of April or May could be held virtually through the use of video conferencing or teleconferencing. The important thing to remember is Although the governor may extend that order, he has not done so to date. So currently that order does expire on June 1st. So we're recommending um, that the districts err on the side of scheduling their budget hearing during that final week of May rather than first week of June to ensure that they can take advantage of that video conferencing uh, capability to avoid and, and minimize spread of COVID-19 and to facilitate social distancing. Next slide. Voter registration has been a very um, complicated issue that was in many ways just left out of the executive order. And as a result, a lot of questions remain. So just the basics here, which as Candace said, this is kind of more an advanced webinar than a beginner webinar. So I won't belabor the basics, but I think they're essential to understand uh, the distinctions that we're gonna be talking about. And if you, as a listener, have not actually been part of a district that uses both systems, you actually may not know this. So um, school districts in New York State uh, can subscribe to either a system of poll registration or a system of personal registration. A system of personal registration, uh, voters have to actually be registered in order to vote uh, in the school district election. They can be registered either with the county board of elections or with the school district. Poll registration, conversely, is where you actually, you, there's no advanced registration requirement. You simply um, show up and if you're a qualified voter, uh, you can be eligible to vote in the annual meeting. So the executive order does not say anything really about registration. And a big question that Candace and I were scratching our heads over last weekend was what does this mean in terms of our now, our quote unquote virtual election, um, the presence and prevalence of COVID-19, and was there an intent on the part of the governor um, to, to alleviate registration requirements? Um, our consensus as a practice here at Bond is that the executive order does not speak to voter registration. Um, and as a result, there, is, there does need to be an effort to ensure voter registration. Um, poll registration, on the other hand, becomes very complicated because uh, you are not able to actually necessarily identify those individuals who are eligible to vote prior to uh, the, the annual meeting. So some strategies that districts can use if you are a district that subscribes to a system of poll registration versus personal registration is that you can canvas other sources of information about voters that may be available to you. Um, you can contact the county board of elections. Even though that list will be over inclusive, it will include people who are registered to vote in the county and not necessarily re residents of your school district. You can remove those members who are not um, residents of your school district in order to come to, to come to a more um, cold list that includes those individuals who are eligible to, to vote and have registered with the county. Another source of information is last year's poll list. So you can reference who actually voted in your election last year to determine um, who is an eligible voter. Uh, another source of information obviously is the parents in your district. Anyone who is the parent who has a child enrolled in the district um, is presumably an eligible voter in the district. Finally, um, most districts maintain a list of contacts for who would receive notice of the budget hearing. Um, and that is another source of information about people who have voted potentially in your elections in the last few years. 
So using all of that information should help you if you were in a district that unfortunately is stuck with um, poll registration in this very unprecedented situation to come up with a list of individuals to whom you are supposed to then mail your absentee ballots um, and the postcard notice required by the governor. We recommend in those districts that utilize poll registration that if you are uh, when you transmit your ballots in addition to the information that's required on the postcard as set forth by the governor that you would also advise um, your voters that you're transmitting one absentee ballot for that household but if they have other members of that household who are eligible voters per the criteria um, that they can obtain additional ballots next slide so only absentee ballots that are received by the office of the district clerk by june 9th at 5 p.m. may be counted. Likewise, we've received a lot of questions and confusion about that. Um, the, the criteria in the education law is not that the ballot be postmarked, it actually must be received in the office of the district clerk by 5 p.m. in order to be counted. Next slide. Okay, Kansas, do you wanna take over the uh, ballot counting? Absolutely. So as far as ballot counting goes, uh, we know that only absentee ballots that are received by the office of the district clerk, 5 p.m. on the date of the election, June 9th, may be counted. Absentee ballots uh, are normally required to be opened in public because Education Law 2018 requires for an opportunity for those who object to certain absentee ballots uh, to be able to uh, lodge those objections. This year, because it is a virtual uh, election in many cases, a remote election in which there will not be voters physically present at the poll site. It's not clear if or how um, a voter would even be able to object and it's likely that there will not be an opportunity for objections to absentee ballots this year. So that begs the question as to whether or not there needs to be some other means of the public being able to view the opening of these ballots and the counting of the ballots. That's not addressed in the executive order. It's also not addressed in the New York State education law. As a matter of practice, we would say that in districts that already have the technological capability to uh, live stream the opening of the ballots and the counting of the ballots, it may be a good idea to do so. It can promote um, a level of transparency that perhaps uh, your public would appreciate. But if your district does not already have the capability to live stream a process like that. And might I add, it's a process that may take quite a long time, so it won't be a short live stream broadcast. Uh, we're not stating that you need to go out and obtain the technological capability to make that happen. This is really an area where you should consult with your school attorneys very carefully because there are pros and cons on both sides. While there's also a level of transparency, there's simultaneously the ability for um, those to question and criticize what you've done during the election. So it's something that you should think through carefully. And as I said, it's not addressed in the executive order or uh, state education law. So it's something that will most likely need to be decided on a case by case basis, basis um, district by district. So we're going to cover some of the questions that we received prior to this webinar. Karen was kind enough to collect questions from uh, the various uh, school boards associations and from the participants in this webinar. And we want to make sure that we cover as many of those questions as possible. So the first question that I'll ask Kate has to do with what is the state going to do for districts during this time? Are they going to provide guidance on the printing of ballots for school elections? Will the state provide a standardized form for use by the districts? Will the state provide a list of approved printing companies who are authorized to print absentee ballots? And unfortunately, the answer is, is uh, you know, unfortunately that we don't have any guidance that, or any inclination at this point that the state is gonna be forthcoming with any guidance and, or any forms to affect any of these um, challenging questions that you're facing right now. Um, we do, however, expect that the executive order um, uh, on, on June, that there will be a renewed executive order on June 10 that extends the provision of the May 1st executive order because by the terms of that order, it's set to expire. So likely that will happen, but I wouldn't hold your breath for additional guidance from the state or templates from the state. 
Next slide. So I'll ask this one to Candace, which is, what is our thoughts about whether districts need to produce voting machine readable ballots? Right. So the answer to that is no. Your district is not required to produce a machine readable absentee ballot. Um, there are questions about whether machines can even be used to count absentee ballots as opposed to hand counting. Um, and for the education law, we know that the absentee ballot envelopes must be opened by an election inspector and then deposited into the proper box. But whether or not that ballot can actually be counted um, via the election inspector using a machine or doing it the traditional way by hand is not covered. Presumably, it can be done either by hand or by a machine. Um, just kind of as a, a practical matter, I know that many of our districts uh, downstate, um, particularly in the Long Island region, have already been informed by the county that machines will not be available to them because those machines will be used for um, county elections and other um, elections taking place in very um, a near time period to the school elections. So they certainly can't depend on having uh, machines available for use. And if you're using a machine, then of course that means you have to go through the process of making sure your ballot is formatted correctly and that you receive it back in time from the printing company and it is um, able to be um, computed properly by the machine. And of course there's a, a process that goes into making sure those ballots are actually produced correctly before they're actually run through the machine. So we just wanna be mindful of those timetables because we have such a short time frame to work with this year and you don't want to run short of time because you're trying to depend on this machine readable ballot when in fact you may be able to do a um, simple kind of hand checked ballot form that is then uh, counted by hand, uh, produce that ballot faster and um, then just have to take the additional time after the ballot is received to do the tabulation of those results. Another question that we've received is, will districts need to print Spanish ballots? And if so, will districts be required to send a Spanish ballot to each qualified voter in the district? And the answer to this question really depends upon whether your district is covered by Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. If you've never heard of the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and you've never been contacted about this, then most likely your district is not covered by it. And I say that because the U.S. Department of Justice has been um, very, um, very intent lately upon communicating with districts that are covered by the section of the Voting Rights Act, which basically requires that if you're in a place where they deem that you have a certain percentage of voters, of residents who do not have English as their primary language. For example, if you live in a school district where maybe 20% of your residents um, have Spanish as their primary language, those districts are required to have materials for the election process available in both English and Spanish to accommodate those Spanish speaking individuals so that they can fully participate in the electoral process. The primary language in your district may not be Spanish. It may be Mandarin, it may be um, Creole. Uh, it really depends on where you're located. But if you are covered by that section of the Voting Rights Act, you've probably already been contacted by the Department of Justice within the last year or two. And you would already be aware of the fact that all of your materials, budget notices, ballots, um, legal notices, all of those materials should be translated into a second language. Okay, what about the questions regarding who is authorized to open and verify ballots, as well as whether the state will require election inspectors to be utilized for this process? Yes, so um, what's interesting about this election is that typically we have absentee ballots in every election. Um, the difference here is that we don't, we, we're going to have all absentee ballots in this election um, and not a lot of, and, and no regularly cast ballots. So that's a big distinction. So. Um, under the education law, there are very detailed provisions around who can actually canvass an absentee ballot. And the answer is that they must be opened and canvassed by election inspectors. Um, district clerks do not have the legal authority to actually canvass an absentee ballot. Going back to Candace's point, this doesn't mean uh, that the, the inspector must actually be the one that tabulates the ballot. 
but they must canvass it, which is a process, a, you know, a process that is specifically outlined in the Ed Law. Um, it involves checking the signature on the ballot, uh, on the ballot application, I should say, against uh, the signature on the voter registration list, um, confirming that that voter hasn't voted in person. And then if everything is in order with the signature, then placing the ballot uh, without looking at the ballot in a designated voting box. Um, so that is poll inspectors that are required by law to do that. So as a result, you are still required to hire poll inspectors. Next slide. Right. Um, another, oh, did you want to interject something, Candice? Sure. No, I, I just wanted to ask you the next question about uh, if a district um, issues the property tax report card and then decides that they want to make changes after the board adopts that budget, is there an opportunity to make those changes? And I think part of the reason that we are receiving this question is because there is such a delay in getting numbers from the state about the level of state aid that districts will be getting. So some are trying to hold off as long as possible so that they can have as much information as possible to formulate their budgets. So is there an opportunity for a redo, a do over, if by chance they adopt a budget and need to change it after that point in time? And this is an excellent question that we have been getting a, a lot of questions about in terms of coordinating the annual uh, election and budget vote with the budget timelines that are unfortunately been really confused and delayed by the state. As everyone on the call is likely in, aware of by now, the governor has uh, designated certain periods during the year in which the state can do a look back and determine whether state aid needs to be reduced. The first reckoning period for that was the period of April 1st through May 1st. So we will be hearing in the coming days whether the state will actually be reducing uh, foundation aid payable to school districts over the next fiscal year. Unfortunately, the way that the executive order is structured and the way that the education law is structured, there is not an opportunity to submit an, an amended or changed real property tax report card. Um, once that document is finalized, that is the budget that the district must bring to its voters on, on June 9th. That does, however, raise the question about a revote. Another question we've received a lot is, will we have an opportunity to have a second bite at the apple if our, if our budget does not pass? Um, ordinarily under the education law, there's an, a uniform voting uh, revote act, which is actually set as the third Tuesday in June. Um, some of you are probably scratching your heads and saying the third Tuesday of June is the very next week after our annual budget vote on June 9th. Um, this, this asynchronous fact is not un, unnoticed by us also, but what I will say is currently, the governor has, doesn't seem to have noticed that irregularity. Um, we can presume that there will be a subsequent executive order that does clarify that fact, um, that, will clarify, that will set, hopefully, hopefully set um, a, a different date as the revote date where districts can put their, their budgets to the voters again. Um, but we do not know at this time what that vote will be. There's been some rumor circulating that it's June 30th. I've also heard the rumor circulating that it's September 1st. Um, at this time, all we can do is confirm that neither of those dates have been set by executive order by state law. So they are speculative at this point. We will, of course, be providing further updates as soon as we get an update from the governor on that. All right, so Candace, what is the earliest time that ballots may be canvassed? And we've been getting that question a lot because we have such an influx of absentee ballots that we're expecting. Of course, districts want to begin starting as soon as possible in order to finish the process as soon as possible. And um, our answer is that 5 p.m. on the day of the election is when we're advising clients to begin counting those ballots. In our mind, the close of the polls time, so to speak, that time that uh, most districts are used to in many places that's 9 p.m. is when we would typically officially close the polls so no one else is allowed in to vote uh, no one else is able to stand online um, you know that is the wrapping up of the process because absentee ballots are due by 5 p.m. on the date of the election we believe that that is the time in which absentee ballots should begin to be counted by the election inspectors And Kate, what is the latest time that ballots can be tabulated? So this is also a very interesting question. Um, I, I joke that I think all my district clerks must learn something in district clerk school that I'm not aware of because um, they often ask the question of, well, don't we have to tabulate 
the election results within 24 hours of the annual budget vote and the close of polls. Um, and that's not strictly the case under the education law. There are 24 hour timelines in terms of when the district clerk must report the results of the election to the Board of Education who then um, must act to declare the result. But the actual time for tabulation is not outlined in state law. Um, so if you're thinking about, do we have to hire um, you know, 2000 poll inspectors to burn the midnight oil through the night and not sleep and not eat um, for 12 straight hours? The answer is no, because there is no date or time set in the law for when the votes must be canvassed. I will say as a public relations standpoint, and a community relations standpoint, please do not construe my remarks on this to mean that I'm suggesting that when polls close at five o'clock on June 9th, that everybody pack up and go home and not start until the next day. I think that um, that certainly could result in, in some public relations backlash. So we're certainly not recommending that. Um, but if it's simply not possible or feasible for you to get your results completed and tabulate your vote within uh, bef before the end of the, the day on the 9th, that is reasonable and completely lawful as far as we're aware. We're not aware of any deadline. The next question. Great. So who can't, who certifies the results of the election canvas? I sort of took this one away from you. Sorry about that. <laughs> sure. No, thank you, Kate. Um, and as far as certifying the results of the election, I think that's another thing that perhaps some people uh, kind of have in their minds early on that is a bit of a myth. Um, just as having to have the ballots counted within 24 hours is a bit of a myth, this idea of certifying the results is not exactly correct. There is no real certification of the election, but there is a declaration by the board of the results of the election. And um, I'll just quickly touch on this because Kate did a great job of explaining it just a second ago. Um, there's no time limit as to how long the election inspectors can take to count uh, those results. Um, the tabulation will take as long as it needs to, but after those results are tabulated, then the chief election inspector reports the results to the district clerk within 24 hours of that tabulation. The school board then tabulates and declares the results of the ballot within 24 hours of their receipt of the results. So I think that's why the 24 hour time period uh, gets floated around uh, very often, but we just want to remember that it's a declaration, not a certification, and that the 24-hour time period really only becomes applicable after the results are tabulated by the election inspectors. Okay, are districts authorized to develop and print absentee ballots in their district for dissemination? Can they do this in-house or do they have to go to a special printing company or go through a county board of elections for assistance? What are they able to do? Yep. So I think that we're getting this question a lot as well because um, there's a standing practice in a lot of districts to use a particular vendor, a particular source to obtain ballots. Um, and that works well in ordinary times when we don't have an absentee ballot going to every qualified voter in the district. Um, but as far as we are aware, there is no requirement under New York state law that you use a particular source, a particular card stock, um, or a particular printing um, uh, company or, or, or uh, entity to be able to prepare those ballots. As long as the ballots contain the information that is required by New York state law, and as long as your ballot envelope contains the information that is required by New York state law, that's all the the law is going to require. Um, you can certainly do that in-house if, if your ordinary vendor is overwhelmed, as we think may well be the case. Candace, when do election inspectors need to arrive? Sure. So in many districts, election inspectors view voting day as an all-day process. They get there early in the morning, make sure the tables are set up, the machines are functioning, and they stay there all day until the last vote is cast and then they begin the tabulation process. This year, because there will not be uh, any voting done during the daytime essentially, because you won't have access to those ballots until 5 p.m., it may not make sense for your election inspectors to arrive early in the morning. Uh, you may want to set a different time frame for them to begin the work day, which um, may be closer to 5 p.m. when the real work will start. Um, certainly um, you're going to pay them for the hours in which they work, but you just may want to consider um, adjusting those hours that you typically need them for. And in closing, 
we just want to remind everyone to keep calm and carry on. This is a time unlike any other time, and we know that you are all doing an extraordinary job, and we really applaud you for all that you've done. Um, I was curious at one point as to how this uh, slogan came about, which I'm sure we've all seen before, and I looked it up and found that it was actually a motivational poster that was produced by the British government in 1939 in preparation for the Second World War. And it was really meant to boost the morale of the public because they were being threatened with air attacks on major cities. And they used that to try to make people feel more positive about the situation. And there is no comparison between war and school district elections and budget votes. Um, we are not trying to draw that comparison at all, but we do acknowledge that this is a difficult time for many of you you are investing so much time and effort and preparation into making sure the election and budget vote goes smoothly and to do the best that you can for your residents. And we really applaud you for all that you're doing. We hope that the information that we provide in this webinar will be helpful to you and that it will provide you with a little more direction and insight than you had before you began listening to us in this webinar. So please feel free to keep in contact with us. Karen and Kate, I don't know if you have any last words as we close out, but thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. Thank you as well, Candace and Kate, both of you. Um, we actually, I noticed we have received a couple of additional questions online here. Um, if you don't mind, I will read them out. If you are not comfortable answering them right away, we will send it out in a follow on email if that makes more sense. Um, so we have one question that says, do we have to give the public an ability to participate during the public hearing? Yep, so I can take that question um, and Candace jump in if you have anything to add as well. The executive order that we're relying on that gives you the authority um, to actually conduct a telephonic or a videographic uh, hearing on the, on the budget um, actually does provide that the public should be offered an opportunity to participate in the public in, in the hearing if the hearing is, is conducted by that means. So our recommendation would be yes, that if you are setting if you're um, endeavoring to do a public hearing via zoom or via any other online technology, that there be a way that you can canvas um, uh, participation and feedback from the public, hopefully in real time through, for instance, the chat feature, the question and answer feature. Um, that's offered through some of these technologies. I'm truly not trying to endorse Zoom. I don't um, mean to do that, but um, but the, many of these technologies do have that ability to to synchronously um, get information from the presenters. So we would recommend that as best practice that you um, would offer the public the opportunity to participate. Candace, do you have anything to add? No, I agree with what you said, and I think you've summed it up. Okay, great. We have another question here that says, "Is there a deadline?" for which the ballots must be mailed? Sure, so I'll take this one. There is no deadline um, upon which the ballots must be mailed. So you may get ballots sent uh, via normal delivery, uh, first class mail. It's possible that you'll get something delivered via overnight mail or next day mail. The main time frame that we want to keep in mind and to stick to is that 5 p.m. on June 9th um, deadline. Um, regardless of how it's mailed, it must be received by that time. So there's no deadline for mailing, but it's the receipt of that ballot, which is really critically important. Okay, well, there's a follow on question to that, which says is that can we, um, do ballots have to be mailed back to the office or can they be dropped off? Do you want me to take a stab at that one, Candace? So sure. <laughs> this this is, this is a tricky, tricky question. And I think a lot of it is going to depend on, and this is one I, I hate to punt, but I'm, I'm going to do the same thing and say, you should consult with your school attorney on this one, because a lot of this is going to have to do with the individual uh, public health situation that you're in. I mean, even if we look at, I'm in upstate, um, Candace is down in Long Island. Uh, the situation that we're in just from a public health standpoint is vastly different um, with respect to this COVID-19 situation. So your risk threshold as a district may be different and may need to be weighed differently depending on uh, the public health uh, reality that we're all facing right now. I can tell you the strict legal answer is that the, the uh, governor's order did not actually change or suspend any of the requirements for in-person submission of absentee ballots. 
that goes back to the, um, the point that Candace made early in the presentation, that that deadline by statute is set at 5 p.m. And the statute does permit a ballot to be uh, handed in either by mail or by hand. Um, that said, there's a conflict because the governor's executive order specifically says that the election shall be conducted remotely. Um, additionally, uh, the, the executive order says that it shall be conducted via absentee vote. Um, so I think there's an argument, frankly, that can be made either way. I think if you're a district that is, um, uh, that's facing a real serious problem with the COVID-19 situation and um, you really want to err on the side of public health, that, that that risk of not having strict compliance with the statute may well be something that in consultation with your school attorney, you decide that you want to do. Um, I think in a district that doesn't have that health risk and wants to prioritize compliance with the uh, compliance with the statute and also has a priority as a board um, of not disenfranchising voters, um, that there may be a preference for strict compliance with the statute. So I think, you know, the, the legal answer, I think, is pretty clear, which is that requirement is still on the books. How it will apply in each particular district um, is going to differ depending on your culture and, and your public health situation. Candace, do you have anything to add? No, there, there is a lot of um, ambiguity uh, regarding that uh, question and the answer to that question. So that's really um, an opportunity where school district clerks and school boards should consult with their attorneys because as Kate mentioned, there are many variables that can make um, situations very different um, district by district. So for example, um, two of the districts that I represent are what we call hot spots, um, meaning that the mortality rate for coronavirus is very high. And just about everyone in those districts knows someone personally who has unfortunately passed away from the coronavirus. So the idea of having uh, masses of people, crowds of people showing up to drop off absentee ballots at 4 p.m. on election day and not practicing social distancing while they're doing that is quite scary. Um, and that may not be the case in every district. Other districts may have different considerations. So uh, please uh, talk to your school attorney and weigh the pros and cons about that issue. Okay, I'm going to, um, I know there are more and more questions being added as we speak, um, but there's one that's come up a few times, which is the question of whether or not, um, if there are multiple voters in a household, if multiple absentee ballots can be sent in one package for the household? Um, yeah, so I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, they're looking to send um, multiple ballots all within one envelope. So there would essentially only be one mailing for everyone in the house. Um, I would advise against that. Each uh, voter is entitled to their own ballot sent in the own in the official means that the district is using for every other voter. I don't think that by virtue of them just living in the same house together, uh, they should automatically be grouped together. Um, not to mention that there are different housing situations. There may be uh, multiple people in a house, but perhaps one is renting from the other one and uh, they don't normally share the mail in that manner. So um, there could be many reasons why grouping it together would not be a good idea and uh, Kate, please let me know if you agree or disagree, but I would certainly recommend an individual mailing for each individual voter. I recommend that for exactly the same way. I, I swear we didn't even coordinate our response on that question, Candace, but um, we, I recommend exactly for exactly the same reasons um, that, that you err on the side of a separate mailing per voter. And the other reason that I would note is that um, the executive order, I think, properly construed really does require that everybody receive a copy of that postcard as well, which needs to be said um, along with the absentee ballot. So I would agree with Candace. Uh, don't, don't, not a place to cut corners, um, simply put. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the additional questions, but um, some of them are fairly detailed. So I would definitely encourage anybody to go and talk to their own district attorney. But in the meantime, thank you truly to Candace and Kate for putting together this information for us and answering our questions on the fly. Um, we are expecting to have a recording of this webinar available um, within a day or two, so we'll let you know by email when that is available. Uh, in the meantime, truly, truly best wishes and best of luck to all the district clerks out there and, uh, and know that anything we can help you with, we're here. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Thank you.